Hello ladies, I hope you're doing very well today. I'm Mrs. Sherman and I'd appreciate it if you would go and listen to this on the link which I've provided in the description box. I don't have comments here on the channel, but you can comment over there on the post. Now, before you get started on your day, this is Homemaking Radio, a place that you can listen while you go about your work, so there isn't much to see here. You can always find a video on how to clean something. I've really enjoyed watching some of the Clean With Me videos because they give you uh, they give me ideas of how much better I could do and what everyone is doing instead of just giving your homemaking a lick and a promise they get in there pull things out clean out uh, containers and trays and the tops of jars and bottles and I really enjoy that but you can go find that over there on somebody else's and this is just to listen to but before you go I'd like for you to uh, look at my teacup. It's an old one. It was one of the first ones I ever bought. I got it through a catalog and didn't use it very much because I thought maybe, you know, that little porcelain rose would chip or be, get food inside of there or tea, which is hard to get the stain off of these little crevices. But lately, I have decided I'm going to get these out and let my grandchildren use them because uh, you can't take it with you. And uh, they might as well enjoy it and have some good memories from it. And it, so that they, even if they do get a little chipped, that's okay because they're just things. And there's probably more where that came from. I'm not even sure where this came from. Maybe it was from one of the tea cup supply sites. I am not sure. I'll give you a picture of that on the post if you want to go over there and listen to this and see the other things that I have placed there. Now, last time I talked to you, I was uh, talking about different things we can do at home to eliminate stress, or maybe it was the previous one before that, and so today I want to continue on that. But before we get started on any of this, if you're not dressed, I think that that is one of the first things you can do to alleviate some stress. For some reason, if you don't uh, have a start, if you don't start, uh, and you don't have a distinctive beginning of your of your life at home that day, uh, it, it can create more pressure on you. I have no idea why that is. But once you get ready, once you get dressed, you fix your hair and you fix your face and you um, make yourself uh, like yourself a little bit more by having a nice clean appearance, then it makes such a difference. Now we are in the middle of a big, big heat wave. I am not sure what it relates to in um, Celsius time, but in Fahrenheit it's 110, 115, and in some places hotter. And not only that, there are uh, the natural fires that come every year up in the mountains, and they send out smoke. And uh, so people are looking, you know, go to the creeks and the rivers and the valleys to get away from it. And I am expecting a rash of company and uh, trying to think of a, whatever kind of activity or trip. I can give them. I don't think I want to do the train again, but might try to do something else. And we had talked about having homeschool revisited and having the children relate things they have learned since then. One of the things I wish I had taught them more of is something about uh, care of money, finances, good investments, bad investments. And one of our A. Becca math books did have a section in there on how to purchase uh, big items and but there needs to be a, a revision of it to keep uh, children and grandchildren safe from interest and safe from uh, bad investments. And for instance, buying used things, you don't know where they've been and you don't know, uh, you know what things have happened that were not revealed. And you have to be really careful about a lot of things. And so that's probably one of the things that they are going to want to present. And then the other thing I heard rumors that one of them was going to come and talk about this um, scripture about the uh, woman who uh, kept asking the judge for uh, some concession or mercy and uh, what she concluded about that. So I'm really interested to know what that is. Another thing I'm doing, uh, because I need so many bookmarks, look, I've already lost this one, uh, is I'm cutting uh, long envelopes into strips so that the flap of the envelope is on this part and that way I can also mark a page and then hook the other one over another page. And we had been talking about 
these old readers of the old days that have been reprinted. They're not really uh, authentic uh, antiques, but uh, they fall apart like an antique. And I was telling you that they were, and this is good for the homemaker too, because they were very rural. And unfortunately, uh, and some of them were uh, imitating what adults do. Like, for example, the children of the last story I read that, that caught themselves in a laundry basket and pretended they were going in a carriage. And they asked their mother if she would like to come. Or maybe it was a train, wasn't it? Yes. And uh, she wanted to know if it was expensive and what uh, sh they wa they wanted to know what she wanted to uh, them to buy for her on the train trip. And all these things that we did, like sitting in a... Uh, bucket and pretending we're in a boat was an imitation of the life around us. It was an imitation of what the adults were doing. And that's why people bought their uh, little girls ki little kitchens, play kitchens, because they were imitating what their mother was doing. They're imitating real life. And they were enacting it and reenacting it. And so um, I uh, I have to tell you that as adults, we have to be careful what we do because they're just going to copy us. And if you're if you're scolding everybody all the time, then they get their little kitchen. They're going to start scolding people too. <laughs> and they'll think that's what they're supposed to do. And uh, so we have to be careful that uh, we portray something we want them to imitate, to to be kind, to be loving, and uh, to be useful. And also, I wanted to tell you more about these readers because they have old uh, really charming pictures but they're all um, country and agrarian and when they have these stories like the one I read to you about the little children pretending they were taking a train ride sadly we don't actually go and see the trains or stand at the station and uh, see people or meet people or, or watch what's going on and it's probably hard to access it anymore but we used to see the boats coming in, the ships coming in. We used to see the train coming in. We used to see different uh, activities going on around us, the farming and the fishing, which I think a lot of children are insulated from and would find hard to imitate. But these are wonderful stories that can take you into the, uh, the life of the natural life and like of the country and of the green grass and of the beautiful skies. And I have some hints of things to do that uh, create less stress or take away stress that include some of these things. But what we can do, you know, there are there have been books written about the backyard. And there was one called Backyard Pharmacy, and there was another one about uh, backyard adventures and all the things people could do uh, with their own nature out in the back. Um, so don't pour concrete on it, on it yet. You might want to use it as a little... Uh, a little grove of trees or or something to play in to build a tree house or anything any kind of adventure that you want to have so you don't have to go far and I know a lot of people are reluctant to go anywhere with all the restrictions going on but hopefully we still have freedom in our own backyard and uh, I think that it's it's a very valuable thing if you only knew the value of having a uh, a piece, a little piece of land right next to your house. It doesn't have to be very big, just a few feet, and do something with it that um, reminds people of this beautiful nature that God has given us. Now, another thing that people still do is they sit by, they can sit by the sea and look. And if you've got children or grandchildren, it's very good to tell them what you see because they really don't know. I remember I had. Um, some girls over for a homemaking class and they were they were 18 and six from 16 to 18 but some of the things that I was pointing them out and having them observe they they didn't take it quite in and we did go for a little walk and I said okay now while we're going for a walk this is for the purpose of relaxing after a hard day in the kitchen or having to do quite a bit of cleaning and so you need to have these little perks and so I said when you walk look for <clears throat> What does the air smell like? Look for what color are the leaves on the trees? What does uh, everything, what are the sounds you hear? How many trees do we walk under where uh, it goes unappreciated, the, the beautiful rustle of the trees in the wind? It goes so totally unappreciated. And those were that's some of the stuff that I'll mention in this uh, de-stressing, anti-stress part. And uh, so I was telling these girls what to think and, you know, how to walk slowly and, 
how to breathe and how to really take it all in as you were walking and intend to come back into the house with a fresh bloom of health and a, a feeling of renewal and how to how you can even pray as you walk and how you can use it as a, the I come to the garden alone experience and uh, um, you know there's also that song there's a garden and it's uh, it was just like a reenactment and one of the girls came in when I asked them, okay, how do you feel about this and, and what did it do for you? Well, they weren't used to it, you know. But one of the girls who was actually the oldest one, had the most education, said, oh, so I went for a walk. Should I just check that off? And it had no impact on her because their minds weren't, some of these girls, their minds weren't really engaged. And we have to teach them this. And that's one of the beauties and reasons for homeschooling is you teach them how to see, how to think. You just give them a little taste of it, and pretty soon they can do it themselves. They don't have to be parroting everything you say. You don't have to um, make robots out of them. Uh, and pretty soon, it's like the way I teach you, and I wouldn't for a minute think that you had to obey every little letter of what I'm saying because you will... I want to work myself out of a job and you will learn how to see things and how to uh, how to understand better and this is the whole point you know that the Bible says you know that our teachers point us to Christ and the rest of it is up to them and so so this is a picture here from the eclectic primer which I guess they call it primer sometimes but primer and uh, I wish I could find the picture that goes with it, but it looks like my pages are all fallen out and I have lost it. Okay, here's a, one of the pictures of the by the sea uh, story here. And those of you who don't live by the sea, if you go to visit the sea, then you must re, uh, prime yourself to what you want to do there, what you want to see there, what you want to get out of it, and what you want to observe. So that when you come home, you come home refreshed and you come home happy about life and extremely excited about the experience of visiting the sea. And some of us that live closer, I have uh, seen it a lot. And I, at this time, it's so crowded that I decided I would stay home and uh, maybe I could get Mr. S to bring me a bag of sand. <laughs> and uh, so I want to read to this about um, the sea, if I can find it here. One day, and these are the words, apparently, they don't have uh, names of, this, of the story, but they do have words. And this is uh, just, it looks like one syllable words. Um, lighthouse, sea, hill, lambs. Um, and it's very short because it's just for little children, but you know, you can get a lot. Have you ever watched little children play and what uh, how, how that relieves you so much of the tension? It's just sit and watch someone play. And in a way, when you read things like this for yourself and give it to yourself, you know, you never know when God might use you to teach or to help someone. So here's the story of the sea. Very, very benign little story with hardly any point, but... Um, it's for little children. One day, Nat and I sat on the high hill by the sea where we could see the tall lighthouse standing out. We could look far out and could see the ships at sea. Well, these days you rarely see a ship at sea, but there are other things that you can see. And uh, many a child has become an artist just by going to the sea and observing the colors and observing what the foam of the ocean looks like. Now here's a little poem and it's called Slate Work. Now I told you last time what a slate was. The reason I'm reading this too is it gives you something to listen to while you work. And I will get into more of your homekeeping and housekeeping after a while. But today I'm going to go as far as I can with life-giving, stress-living reports. So here is the poem that they have to write in their on their slate and you know what a slate was you could lift the vellum up and it would uh, erase and then start over again so they avoided paper if you recall 
because paper was a lot more valuable. And I was shocked in the 50s, the amount of paper we brought home with just a few things written on one side. And uh, our parents had taught us how to use up every bit of paper. And they were from the, uh, from the Depression. And they were shocked at the waste of paper. <laughs> I remember them telling us of that. So here are the words. While, done, might, right, time, your, things, and haves. Work while you work, play while you play. One thing each time, that is the way. Now look, that's a great lesson for me to learn because I just want to play while I work <laughs> or I want to stop and do something else and I'm terribly behind. All that you do, do with your might. Things done by halves are not done right. Well, that's true. Sometimes in emergency, I do have to do things by halves. Someone's coming quickly and I have to pile things up. But uh, that's just an emergency. I'm hoping it won't be a habit. And uh, so there are, and there are also beautiful scenes here that are great for children. Very hard for them to understand if they've not been brought up rurally or not have much exposure to the rural life. But there's a girl, she's looking at that tall tree observing that tree and so let me read you the story um, do you see that tall tree long ago it sprang up from a small seed do you know who made it do so it was God my child God made the world and all the things in it he made the Sun to light the day and the moon to shine at night God shows that he loves us by all that he has done for us. Should we not then love him? And I think it's really important if you're teaching something like that to anyone, or you claim to be a Christian, that you be kind and loving in uh, imitation of Christ. Because I, uh, in my day, of course, we all knew people who... Uh, could really be nice at church, but the minute they got home, they were busy shouting at people and um, being uh, verbally abusive and that sort of thing. And this is the kind of thing that uh, that detracts from the Christian message and makes it uh, less credible. So we have to be really careful. And we women at home, especially, we're going to be the light of the home. And this is really important, our countenance and our demeanor. And we can't let... Uh, irritations throw us off. Now one of the things that we're doing here is we're trying to recover lost keys. <laughs> Over the years, now you would think on farmland you could find things, but the terrain is so uh, repetitive and so similar everywhere that nothing seems to stick out and you think of it as a flat land and you'd be able to find a key with a tag on it that's green or something. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. And a few years ago, I lost a whole set of keys. And there were some to the barn, some to the shed, some to the cars, and some to the house, different parts of the house. And I couldn't find them. And I, yet I had had them in my hand one second ago. I had unlocked one of the sheds. And uh, it fell out of my hand and, and dropped at my feet. I felt it at my feet. But when I went down to look, and I had gloves on, so I was scraping the ground and everything, that thing just disappeared, just disappeared so fast. And that was years ago, and I got a new set. And then uh, over the years, Mr. S has dropped a key here and there, and we've gone back and we've looked for it. It's like um, being in the outback. It all starts to look the same after a while. You cannot find anything. So uh, we are investing in a um, metal detector. <laughs> We're going to go back and pick up all the keys from 1990 see what we can find if they're not buried too deeply. I, I just have a suspicion that some of those rabbits are using them. They might need them, you know, to unlock something. I don't know, but I can't figure out why they disappear like that. One of them even had a, a tape measure on it, one of those metal tape measures on it as the as the tag, and it was big and it was red, and I couldn't figure out why that never showed up, but Anyway, so that's that's the big news here today, and uh, well, I hope you've got good news. And so, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about people's excuses. I want to get into the people part here because uh, you're going to be listening to a lot of people explain away the reason that they are not following the path of good sense, of sensibility, and good judgment. And it doesn't have to be teenagers. It doesn't have to be young people. It 
is something that people always fall back on their excuses when they don't want to own up to their responsibilities at home. Even women can do it, and men can do it. So I got to wondering about all the uh, people I had known over the years as a preacher's wife who just couldn't seem to get their life together or were doing okay and just kind of went off the deep end and decided to go run off somewhere. And uh, it was everything from uh, young people to people that had been married a long time or people who had never been married. And uh, just the life that they chose to lead was rather unusual and eccentric and wild compared to how they had been. And uh, so when they were approached by really kind people who were worried about them, they would give excuses. And uh, so here are some of the excuses. Um, I've had, I had a bad life growing up. <laughs> I had a bad life at home growing up. Well, we were always able to counteract some of these excuses because we knew people who had a bad life at home growing up and and they were determined to go the right way uh, because they saw the mistakes of their, of their predecessors. And so that was used as an excuse. I've never seen that in, a, in the Bible as an excuse. Um, not getting to be able to dominate everyone. After a while, uh, someone at home that seems to be always having blow-ups and always having uh, wanting to aggravate people or accuse his, his wife, his parents, or her uh, her father, or she, she or he, whoever's doing it, they want to dominate. And after a while, people tolerate it so long, and then they'll ask him not to boss them around anymore. So they'll just say, well, that's it. I'm leaving <laughs> <laughs> and so that one we were able to squelch quite quickly. You know, how much uh, dominating are you trying to do and why are you upset? Because you couldn't run people? Because you couldn't dominate them? Um, now, I think there is a scripture in 1 Corinthians 13 which could cover all of these things. Love does not seek its own way. And that just means selfish things, self, self-centered reasons. Um uh, the other one was, I want to uh, run off because I'm, I want to help others. And yet they will abandon their own families and not help. I have known many uh, a widowed woman who was abandoned because her children decided they just didn't want to help. And that they would use the excuse that they went into ministry. And now they're going to help people. And uh, what about, and it always uh, was kind of almost... Um, really mysterious in a way because they could not help anyone in the neighborhood. They never won a soul to Christ in their in their immediate friend circle. Uh, they And yet they were going to run off and join something and uh, so they could help others and win souls. And uh, so whenever you're trying to do something outside of the home that you could that you could attempt to do at the home, that there's another reason. And so they wanted to help others. Not many of these people ever stayed long in what they were doing. They were just trying it out. Uh, the other one was, my family doesn't understand me. You know, everybody has moments at home when the daughter, the husband, the wife, the children, uh, the parents uh, are, are not understanding or there's a disagreement everybody. But there's always somebody on the other side waiting for someone who has uh, had some misunderstandings to sympathize with them. And what do they have for them? Oh, you can um, get into this business with me. You can share this apartment with me. And it's always something that's going to cost that person more. And uh, they'll leave their free rent at home and go and pay more to live somewhere else. Uh, from their own rebellion and their life will just uh, become more complicated. Now, um, if you're going through this right now, just remember you're better off under the same roof and you're better off uh, not having your finances stretched so thin. And uh, I know that they have. Uh, there's been a lot of people that have put up with some pretty rough situations back in the, I would say, in the Depression times but they managed it okay. Uh, it just wasn't perfect, you know. Then the other one was, uh, oh, I have my family's approval. I have my wife's approval. I have my husband's approval. And what they've done, uh, just to analyze it a little bit, is that they talked their families into it 
Otherwise, the families wouldn't get to see them again. They'd say, you know, if you don't um, support me in this and you don't agree with it, then uh, I just, I'll run off forever. I'll never see you again. And so they bend to their child's will or somebody else's will who wants to do something that isn't good uh, and not good for the family. Um, it's very touchy to explain it because there's always somebody who will tell you that they were justified in what they did and there's always exceptions. We know that. And um, the other thing I wanted to, uh, so I wanted to tell you about that, that whenever, you ought to be very wary when you hear someone say that um, they're having trouble at home and it's intolerable to live there anymore uh, because you've got, you're going to have to investigate it a little bit better and uh, see what's really going on. It could be that people that create a disturbance in their home cause other people to cry, to react, to beg them to stop. So then they run off and say, uh, my family's reactionary. Uh, my uh, the people at home are they're just a bunch of crybabies or something like that and they don't uh, tell anyone what how they instigated the heartache and the trouble that they have caused and you'll find plenty of you know when you're growing up uh, and your parents are religious or they're homeschooling you or you live out on a homestead there's always those that will tell you that uh, you are going to uh, really have problems later on in life because you're so uh, family oriented and you're so isolated and and they almost program that into people so that uh, they, they'll say you'll rebel someday and they almost are programming that into people I was listening to somebody on a radio program the other day that were talking about how many uh, decades ago there was a some kind of a scheme to get uh, families away from each other so there wouldn't be any bonding there and that way they could get people to stand for causes that were not right and the idea was to break up the home and of course they did it through the schools and they did it through the workplace too because I don't know if many of you ever watched movies in the 1980s that depicting someone who was had so many demands on their time at work uh, that they didn't get to see their families and they didn't even they were out of touch they didn't even know what was going on and they try through religion too because um, many times the churches uh, kept the families kind of split up you know where one of them was over here doing one thing another one was over there doing another thing all in the name of church or or ministry and so um, I think it's really important to um, point people to the home at, if possible um, to make the home make life better at home for other people and uh, not be a drag on everybody but but just make a delight to be around that's the best that that's the best thing and to build one another up now we find this a lot with uh, particularly girls who don't really want to keep house they don't want to be uh, they they don't want to help at home so they'll choose to do something away from home that uh, requires talent so they'll say they have a talent and so then they're gone all the time uh, pursuing this talent but really they're getting away from home I don't see why we can't pursue our talents in the home I've tried to uh, show you ways that you could do this in the past so I have one more little complaint here and that is how uh, the question that came to me and I've been pondering it for a long time I didn't quite know what to say uh, And that was how to prevent people taking photographs of you without your permission. Now, as to why why you would object to someone taking your photograph, here here's some of the problems I see in that in people taking your photograph without you being prepared. Number one is you don't know where the photograph is going um, these days. Number two, I have seen several people who. Um, had friends that took pictures of them and then put them in a little book for them and gave it back to them that's fine but the pictures were all blurry or they were in the dark or they were just uh, put them in a bad light and really disappointed them and uh, not something you'd want to hand down to your grandchildren you know and of course uh, when she complained about it they accused her of being vain or something but uh, it's not just that it's just that 
I think what a good idea would be, you know, you have these tea parties or ladies class, and everybody wants to take a group picture. Sometimes group pictures don't work out really well. Um, I haven't seen very many that I like, and that is some of them, you won't catch everybody looking at uh, in the same direction at the same time. Some of them are looking down, some of them have one eye closed, and that is to say, uh, if you don't mind, I don't take group pictures very well, but I would be happy to supply you with a photograph of myself. And get yourself a photograph that you're happy with and get it reprinted, carried around with you, and then just hand people the photograph that you want. You know, in the olden days, uh, if people wanted someone to have a photograph, they'd get one taken that they were happy with and they would choose the one they liked. But when someone else is taking your picture, they really don't know uh, much about you to know what would you like. And one time someone took a picture of a friend of mine and put it in a pretty frame and everything and it was supposed to be a gift but she wasn't, she had not paid attention to detail and uh, there were some, there was some underwear that was showing and there, and this was in the day when people cared about that stuff. And there was also sh big shadows going around uh, which made her face look really long and just looked a little bit uh, out of sync, out of just kind of grotesque. And also, uh, it was pixely, and so I would just say, if you are tempted to, if you're one of these people that love to take pictures, be sure and ask. Um, and if someone declines, don't go into it like there being uh, something wrong with them. Don't go into it like, oh, really? Why not? You know. And those of you who are being pestered that don't want your picture taken, and somebody says, really? How come? You know, everybody else wants their picture taken. Uh, just politely say, I really prefer not to, but I'd be happy to supply you with a picture if you need it. Uh, some of us just, I think some of us don't realize that other people don't appreciate it, you know, when we when we just take all these group pictures. So I always ask, uh, and what I'll do uh, sometimes to my grandchildren is show them a painting like uh, Edmund B. Layton or some of these other people that painted pictures of the Victorian woman and say, now what kind of uh, pose would you like if I were to paint this of you? And particularly on my sidebar on the left, there's the picture of that woman by someone named Meg Gret. And uh, she's carrying a basket of flowers and she's coming in the doorway and there's a scene in the background. And I, uh, my, some of my granddaughters like to choose that as a way to, to make a theme that I could take a picture of this that they think might turn out okay. And then of course the picture does not go to anyone except for me. And they take care of their own uh, pictures. Families take care of their own pictures when they send out their Christmas letter. They always have, they have these cards now that are photograph uh, paper and they, they, they have it arranged the way they want it. And um, while it might be nice, you know, to think that we could just go um, take pictures of anybody we want and, you know, put them on our, uh, on our blog or Facebook or something, we do really have to be careful. And also, I noticed too, uh, where real estate is concerned, sometimes you see a pretty house and you can take a picture of it, you put it on your blog and then somebody finds out and they want to charge you money uh, for rent <laughs> because uh, that's not your property and you're not allowed to put that there. Well, it's the same with people too. We do have to be careful. I have been to enough um, ladies Bible classes and tea parties and things to know that there are some women that don't want to be involved and I feel sorry when everyone when uh, the hostess stands up and says okay everybody get in a circle let's get a group of us all together uh, and I'll notice one lady will uh, go on down the hall or something and not have anything to do with it she probably just got tired of and I have heard from other people they get tired of uh, them not really taking a very good picture of everybody and uh, while some people like pictures of groups just to remind them of the group and everything, um, some people just would prefer you not get their picture unless they are, um, unless they're ready and unless they knew they were going to get their picture taken. And I've heard people say, if I'd have known they were going to take my picture, I would have worn something different. Uh, and we, we need to be really careful about that. It can really be hurtful. And... Um, so just be careful about that. So now I want to do a little bit about, uh, but one thing you can do, we'll go back to the bad photo thing. One thing you can do if bad photos is your problem, in case people don't do what you say and leave you alone and not get your picture, every morning get yourself dressed up as though you were going to get your photograph taken. And that way at least that part is taken care of. If they take a bad photograph, they're just bad photographers. And uh, 
you know, you, you still don't have to, but at least get yourself prepared in case it happens. And you can also get yourself on your exercise program and uh, your uh, clean eating program, improve your health, improve your weight, so that if someone does take a picture, uh, you look pretty good. And, uh, and there's always a chance for everybody, no matter what your age is, to improve. Now, one thing I noticed about um, exercise is something that you might want to be aware of. You're going to have to figure out a very stealthy way of getting in your time for your, your prayer, your Bible study, your exercise, your, your overall dressing and preparation, bathing and all that when there are people around. For example, if you've got a horde of company coming in, all the descendants come at once and you've given up a lot of rooms, you've given up the main bathroom, you're you're back in a little um in a little dorm room by yourself, you're going to have to figure out ways to keep up your routine because I would tell you what happened. Uh some time ago I did have uh, some company so I thought, well I won't do my uh, stretches today. I won't do my on my mail today, every day I like to at least mail three things, three letters, or do do three send send a package, something every day. Uh, but I gave it up, and this company was there maybe four weeks. And so all that time, I wasn't doing the physical activity, and I wasn't following my, uh, being careful with eating, and, uh, and also rest, and periods of just uh, breathing, and thinking straight, and doing regular doing regular things that uh, are calming and then what happened was after they left I wanted to get I saw that I needed to get back into my exercises and what occurred was that I now had to start over from the progress that I had made at one point I could uh, maybe move my shoulders back a certain way and absolutely no pain nothing at, at one point I could uh, do certain uh, turns and um, and with ease, with ease. But then I discovered I had gotten stiff. And when you leave your exercise that long, you've got to start all over and get up to the point you were where you were at. Remember, I was at where I could run and where I could jump. Well, after they stayed such a long time and I neglected, it wasn't their fault. But I had not uh, made provision for my time to, you know, sneak out onto the back patio or something and do all this. Um, so I had neglected it, thinking, you know, I'll just take care of them first. But you've got to take care of yourself first or you can't take care of your company. And you can't be a good example to them. And as you get older, you need to be healthy. You need to be strong. You need to be uh, smarter, better looking, <laughs> better uh, prepared, uh, more organized, and all these things. And don't slack off when someone comes and you know we had an a aunt my husband's aunt and she on the farm relatives were always there at, at her place and she would say well i'm going to go lay down now and she'd take her her regular nap people would go around looking for her saying where is she she took her nap she she got to where she didn't even tell us she'd just go and take her nap and um so you have to start all over because i was very stiff and i had to start the slow five minute chair stretch exercises and here I had been way up there where I was uh, in training and I was running up and down a ramp and I was able to jump but it all it all went backwards and that's what will happen if you it, it will happen if you get sick maybe um, now I had uh, my mother-in-law that even when she wasn't feeling well if she's sick she'd get out of bed and stand by the side of the bed and try to touch her toes you have to do that or you will um, go into atrophy <laughs> and uh, deteriorate. So now I'm working on coming back, the big, uh, the art of the comeback. <laughs> and so uh, I just wanted to warn you about that, to keep up and keep on uh, one of the exercise programs that I use on YouTube. She has a, and you can find some of these yourself. She has a maintenance program. So that if you're not able to get to uh, the current exercise or regular exercise, you've got at least some things that will maintain um, your muscles and your um, the core of your body and your strength and also your weight. So I think that's really important to look at the maintenance. So here are some things that you can do to uh, that are kind of recreational that are 
that are calming and will take away stress. We need to really not let the world, there's enough stress in the home without letting the world plant more on us from what they're going to be up to. Now, they're never going to give us any peace, are they? I wrote down something about it that uh, they'll keep you in a constant state of uncertainty, wondering, uh, well, when uh, when is everything going to be okay? You can't listen to them. They're they're not messengers of peace, and uh, they're not like what's it, what we read in the Bible. And um, so do more than for homemaking. This is very helpful, also quite calming, really. Do more than your best. Like compete with yourself, and, and it's like an athlete. They have a stopwatch, and they compete with themselves. They try to beat their own record. So do more than you think you can. Do more the next day than you did the day before. Try to outdo yourself. And um, and it takes courage. You know, I told uh, somebody that courage comes from the word core, which means the heart. And uh, we used to say, take heart. And um, the captains used to tell their soldiers, take heart. And uh, it's turned into the word courage, which means... Uh, uh, be a hero, but that's not what it really means. Courage just means to do it, to take heart, to do it with your heart. And it's like the scripture that I read to you uh, yesterday is whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Uh, as unto the Lord and not unto man, for ye serve the Lord God. Now, so here are some things that you can do every day. If you're getting to where you're short of breath, there's a big mess around you, you can't seem to uh, conquer it. You've got some things done, but you're losing your will. You're lo using your courage. Okay, number one is uh, pray and praise. You know, sometimes in the deepest time, we're always quick to ask God for help. Yes, we beg and plead for help, which is good. But have you ever thought to use some of these situations where life is not so good as a point of praise? Just try that and see how that changes uh, your mind it changes your thinking to think a little bit uh, more hopefully to use praise the other is uh, listen to something pleasant listen to something pleasant now I uh, gave you the example of going outside and listening under a tree just on purpose listen to things or go outside and try to listen to things now believe it or not when we were little we enjoyed listening to an airplane go overhead it was a sign of progress and it was back in the olden days and it just made you feel so good uh, the modern things so if we watched an airplane go overhead we were quite delighted and we love the sound of it but today of course we've got all kinds of industrial sounds and it's not always pleasant but uh, you can find small sounds to listen to that are pleasant to the heart and more calming so the other thing is to take a walk now, remember when I said take a walk, make sure it's a sense, senses walk so that you know what you're trying to see, hear, feel, taste. Um, different seasons are, have different air. It's absolutely delightful. And this is, this is the thing that introduction to chapters of great novels are, are made of. You know, um, the air was uh, bursting with uh, the flavor of, you know, etc. And... Um, so, uh, and remember not to come home like adult, like I told you about, where you just want to, oh, click that off my list, but absorb it, to absorb it. And, you know, people do the same thing of what I was mentioning about, you know, taking these students for a walk and then trying to explain to them how to feel and, you know, how to open up their uh, senses so that they could see what God had done. And... Um, People do the same with reading. You can give them something to read. Let's say that paragraph that I've been trying to find, uh, we should always be cheerful. And um, it said our hearts may be encouraged by the good things around us and uh, being sad uh, is not going to change anything. And uh, I'll try to find that for you. But some people, you can hand it to them and you say, just read this. And they'll read it very mechanically, every word very mechanically, but they don't join the words together for the thought and for the feeling that it's supposed to produce in the heart and the conclusion. And they'll say, yeah, okay, I read it, hand it back to you. They don't, uh, they don't have uh, the training to absorb it and to decipher it. And I think that's really important. And I believe in the Bible, they're called dull. 
um, you know, the thinking is dull. So you need to train yourself out of that, okay? So, uh, another thing you can do is just pick a flower. Just pick something, even if it is a weed. And I remember my kids, they thought dandelions were flowers. So they would bring in big fistfuls of dandelions. I'd go ahead and put them in a little vase of water and and um, behave very like I was very pleased because they are one of God's uh, plants. And so just pick whatever you can find. It might be winter or whatever, but you know, even if it's a couple blades of grass, bring it in and just pick it because that's part of one of your calming activities. Um, and it is look for or read something pleasant and um, then take a picture. Now here's a picture you don't have to get permission for, is to take a picture of something, even if it's just a little display that you do yourself in your house or some finished job, take a picture so that you can look at it and analyze it and see how you could do something different maybe. The other one would be to get off alone and sing quietly a song. Have you? How long has it been since you've done that? The world has made everything so professional that the little song of the woman at home is not considered valid and if, if she's ashamed to sing because someone might say she uh, she can't sing but everybody can sing um, so the other thing would be to uh, create some small thing and it doesn't have to be sewing and it doesn't have to be uh, any kind of uh, crafting or anything, but what if you were just to clear the table off and put a centerpiece on there? These kind of movements prevent um, depression and uh, the stress from beating down on you. And so ladies, I hope that this has helped, but I wanted to show you something so you can stop working and look. And I've told you about this before, and it's called a set of values. I don't know if I've shown this on here before, but I did it on a Zoom class for uh, my family and for some other students. Now, what it was, was in the, and I couldn't find any coins or anything, so I'll just tell you. It was in the olden days. Uh, when you went in and you brought, uh, let's say, well, there are a couple of things. You wanted to buy some goods and products. Oh, you wanted to buy some flour. You wanted to buy something else. And uh, you wanted $2 worth. So they would take a weight, I've just got a little old used battery here, and they put the weight on there, and then they would pile up the product you were trying to buy to equal that weight so you would know that you got the balance, you know, the balance, so that you, you would know that you got it, and uh, that it was supposed to balance with that weight and then it would be fair. Now, now and then you'd find some dishonest person that would put something else over on the other side um, or take off this weight and put something lighter or something like that and cheat you. You and people, Or they put their thumb on the scale. Remember that saying? He had his thumb on the scale. And so here's how I'm going to explain your set of values, okay? This is hard for me. Because everybody has this, this, this little set of values in their brain. You have something over here and something over here, and when things don't quite balance out, um, it doesn't. Something just doesn't seem like right. there's too much weight in this area and not enough weight in this area. So, example, um, trying to think of what it was I was going to use, and it's probably some uh, example that doesn't have the weight its paper was written on. Um, okay, let's just use that scripture. Uh, whatever thy hand finds to do, do with all thy might. Okay, so I'm just going to, uh, and it's from the Bible. So I'm going to put it over here and uh, pretend that it's a weight. And um, it's just a, just a verse, it's just a principle. But then uh, you say, or somebody says, uh, I just really, I don't think that's important. I think I'd rather uh, play video games today. So you put this up here, and you see how lightweight it doesn't balance out does it it doesn't balance doesn't even attempt to balance that and uh, in your mind uh, your children are wanting to do something and they will say uh, can I go jump in the lake today and it's like maybe freezing ice and snow day and your 
mental balance says no that's not right but there are people who will come along and convince you that uh, you're off you're you're off your balance is off and that uh, you're unbalanced because you won't uh, you won't allow that another thing would be uh, young children wanting to do really uh, dangerous or grown-up things uh, and dressing too uh, too grown up too soon and your your balance scale says uh, this is not right these are still children um, I don't want them to grow up too soon and so you say no so on your on your scale your your mind is either going to say yes or no yes or no and then if you start second guessing yourself and you start letting other people talk to you about it but your instincts just tell you that's a no you know and one of the things that was helpful to me was uh, knowing what our parents didn't allow and uh, just going with that although they didn't always give us reasons as I got older I could see by me not being allowed to do such and such I was better off for it because I, I noticed that a lot of people uh, let their children grow up quite liberally and let them participate in things that I was not any uh, not interested in because it wasn't allowed in our family so we just did other things and I saw how eventually it harmed them and uh, and also how it did not benefit their lives and so ladies as far as that goes it's hard to uh, understand but you have a set of scales in your mind and if you will trust them you will know something is right or not right well we use them even when we're cleaning house and we're um, poofing the pillows and we're saying oh that's that end doesn't look like it balances the other end or th these things don't look good together and you just you just kind of um, use your uh, knowledge and you use your wisdom to put something together well it's the same in the home when we're using our set of values should we spend uh, more money uh, on this over here when it doesn't have uh, lasting values and no one's going to use it half the year would that be wise or not and your mind will just say yes or no and that's where you're in a way that's how your set of values are formed by practicing them by practicing saying well that's okay or that's not okay this has been a difficult one to uh, describe to people because most people develop their values from uh, from the commercial world from television and always when you go to a store they're going to say uh, this is a great value in fact there's one store here that all their products are called great value <laughs> And, but you have to compare. You have to say how much weight is in this um, and compare it to another one that maybe costs more but uh, per ounce. And also at all, on our stores, on the edges of all the shelves, you can tell how much the item costs per ounce um, compared to the other one. That way you can get a better value. But you also have to weigh the cost of everything. You have to count the cost of everything. And it's the same with making a decision for the home or for the family. And like these people I said uh, that over the years I've noticed that want to want to stir up the family or, or leave home or get involved in things that um, aren't really sound activities, uh, they're not using um, a good set of values and they've got their thumb on the scale on one side. So ladies... I hope that you have a lovely day today and I hope you get a lot done also. If this has not afforded you enough time, go to the continuous play on the left of my videos and maybe another one will come on. And I hope to see you here more often. I'm expecting another big batch of company, so I'm hoping to get a few ahead because um, I might have to take another week off. So I'm talking to you later. Bye.